Okay, let's look at the gallery view. All right, how many of you did rent? Kara and Lisa, Lisa and Casper. Okay, great. So that's a, it's very popular. And also we used the, one of the really primary songs from it in our musical last fall, our musical review called Looking Back, Looking Forward. So that was kind of a, a fun thing. Um, what, what were some of the other picks? Sue, I know you went back and forth with a couple. I decided Fiddler on the Roof. Okay. Because I actually think I saw it in New York with my mom. That's a good memory. Yeah, that and was then, a long time ago because it started in 61, I think I read, yeah, and, but it ran 10 years. Right. And that's possible because I lived in Connecticut for a few years, but then I moved to New York. So that's possible I saw it at the end of its and, play. And then you could see it anywhere in the US in any community because it became just a beloved musical. Okay, anybody else do Fiddler on the Roof? Okay, you have the privilege of being a solo imaginary person there. Okay, well, who picked some other things? Kylie, what'd you pick? Um, sorry, ah, I unmuted myself. Oh, sorry, I chose the prom. The prom, okay, so very new, extremely new. And uh, I just got the DVD in the mail. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've seen it. Um, I didn't get to, the chance to listen to the actual like Broadway production or anything. So my really only exposure was the movie. Okay. So what's one of the, what's one of the things that's a curiosity about that particular piece? There was been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of news on that one. Well, I was always like interested. I just never got the chance to like listen to the Broadway production. So I was like, this time I gotta like watch the movie and I'm like a visual person. If I just listen to the music, I won't fully understand what's happening. So I'll have to find like a, an illegal bootleg. So watching the movie, like help me like fully understand what was happening and all the plot points. Um, I do have mixed feelings about it though, the movie. Okay, well, we don't have to go into that. Did anybody else do the prom? The, the, the in particular thing that was being written about with the prom, which is something that is, that is um, so common with musicals that are on stage first and then become movies is that they do not select any of the actors from the stage production to be in the movie, you know? And it's a very, it's a very interesting and this particular piece was heartbreaking because the person who was the lead in the prom and the musical on stage was not selected for the movie. And here she is in the unemployment line. So, you know, I think that it's uh, poignant to think about the work that has been done on the backs of theater artists and the amount of time workshopping and the amount of time to get a story together and then having it co-opted by a movie and, you know, vice versa in all fairness. Okay, what did some of you else pick? I did Into the Woods. Ah. And? I mean, like Kylie, I'm just going based off the movie because I can't really find um, like Into the Woods, like the musical play. So we I'm may be able to find it this semester because they will be, some of them will be posted again, but um, yeah. And did you, um, did you watch the movie? Yeah, I did. Oh, good. And what'd you think? Well, I saw it when it came out in 2014 and I really liked it, so. This is one where I thought, did anybody else see the movie Into the Woods? Okay, I actually thought that the movie was better than the play, so that was interesting. And uh, who else? Did we miss anybody? Colby, did you make a pick yet or no? No, I haven't, but I was thinking of the producers, but that's like the opposite way. The movie was made and then they made the musical. So right, we want to go the other way. way. So, um, okay, anybody else that. or anybody else undecided? Wait, so I, have now Colby, on, have hmm? I have a question on like the one part of the assignment. Yeah, who is this? Uh, George. 
Okay, sorry, I can't. Um, well, like, I finished. I did mine on Les Mis, and, like, I oh! finished it, basically. But um, for the part where you're supposed to name, like, all the awards and stuff, um, it's, like, really long. So should I just, like, put the awards and, like, nominations how you put it, or should I, like, write it all out? Copy and paste. Okay, cool. I'll just, like, source it. Then so, the yeah, here's website. the thing. Yeah, you can just do a link. Um, okay. One thing that I am really, really big on, no wasted energy. I really don't want to give you any busy work. I'm not just going to have you copy stuff down because you should copy it down. You know, that is not it. I really never want the answer out of the book. I really want your opinion on how things work. So yes, that, that was just a, a way to have you look at more information about the play than just the play's name or just the title. And also to help you understand what are these awards and what are these nominations and what are these things that can really be um, make or break a, a musical or make or break any sort of entertainment event. And that's you know popular opinion. So I, that's the reason behind that, behind actually seeing any awards and nominations and also generally movies that get get made that have been based on musicals. The musical was already an outstanding star in its own field and then became a, a, you know, a different kind of property, a different kind of media. So is that, that's, thanks for that question. That's totally fine. <laughs> I think I mentioned that last time, George, that you could just either link or copy and paste it. So it's completely fine. Okay, cool. <laughs> John, we're talking about the musical that we picked. So, excuse me. Where the assignment, the the musical, the stage musical you picked that then became a movie. Did you pick one? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I just okay. saw the in the right uh, assignments. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. Okay. Also, now before we move on, I just want to double check about the book because I'm going to start assigning a reading assignments, and. Uh, I know, Jean, I sent the, the notice to the bookstore. Did you ever hear anything from them? No. Okay. And uh, is everyone else okay with the book? Just click yes in your participants or thumbs up in your participant screen. And then what I'll do is maybe I can go walk over to the bookstore and see what's going on with that because they did not respond to me and that's, that's pretty bad. So I will you, try and look at that. And if for some reason we get stuck is anybody else a no that you cannot get your hands on the book? Okay. Uh, my, I should get mine maybe next week, earliest. I'm not sure what the situation is exactly. I was supposed to get it already, but I don't know what's going on with it. Okay. So just, you know, keep me updated. And what I can do is maybe I'll, um, if there's a specific reading that I need you guys to do, I'll try and scan it and then see if I can just upload it to you or put it on our site. But that means I'll be at the Xerox machine going like this. I wonder if the li library has them digitally. They just sent out an email today about digital books. I saw that. I saw, I mean, I saw that Kenley sent out a thing that contacting the library is a good idea because it is a textbook. And so, um, and it has been a textbook for a couple of years. So maybe the library would have it. And I don't know if they'd be on a digital or they may be able to seek it, find it, at, find a digital copy somewhere. So that's an excellent idea, Cara. Okay, thank you very much for everyone. And uh, Josefine, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, you told me to uh, take this up uh, in class uh, with the, uh, the group discussion in the Heights, which I couldn't uh, submit. Okay, right. Okay, has anyone else not been able to submit certain things? So if you just give me hands up if you need to submit and I can open up the discussion of In the Heights again and I'll open up uh, the assignment. Is that one, let me see, is that one already passed? I think the one for the rent and, or the musical and plays due Thursday is what I saw. So it's due this Thursday. This yeah, Thursday. this Thursday. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you have some time to finish that up, you guys. And if there's anything else that you want to do, or like Maria, you actually watched the musical, 
then that's, um, that's something else that you can do because we will have a play critique due and that might be uh, watching the musical that you've picked might be an excellent way to initiate your play critique. So what I'd like you to do, how can I do this? Well, I'll try and make, let me just do a quick list here and then I'll publish a list and then we'll try and have, um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of rewrite that play critique so that it will understand, uh, it can appeal to the musical that you've seen. And so watch your musical and then you can use that for your play critique. And what I'll do is I'll assign play critique number one and it'll say musical to movie, watch movie, okay? And then we'll look at um, some musicals that are available online and they are filmed versions of stage musicals. And all of the Andrew Lloyd Webber were available last semester. They tend to be open a very brief time, like they open Friday at noon and they end Sunday at 5 p.m. So you have to really mark your calendar to watch it. Okay, so I had for Rent, I had Kolb, I had Kara, Casper, and who else? There were three of you. Who did Rent? I did. What? Okay, who's I did? I can't, I'm not seeing you. Me, Liza. Elizabeth. Liza. Okay. And then here's what I have Fiddler, Sue. Kylie did The Prom. Maria did Into the Woods. George did Les Mis. Serafina, did you do one? Or not yet? Serafina. Okay, so I have Colby, Serafina, and Jean as one. I picked, I got mine. Oh, you got yours. What is it gonna be? Chicago. Okay. I haven't got one yet. Who is that? Josephine. Josephine, you don't have one yet. Okay, so just take a look and then let me know so that uh, I will organize that play critique so it'll work for a movie because I want you to reference the musical first and then how we work it into the movie. It'll be sort of a comparison kind of play critique and that will, have, that will get us into the genre. So I'm gonna make that note. Okay. I feel like we can't avoid the movie um, aspect of it. Let me just make sure I have everybody. Okay. And how many of you looked at the uh, PowerPoint from last time? The, oh, not that. <laughs> Just a second. Let's take a look at it. It's an introductory um, to musical theater. I don't know why I have a little, yeah, no worries, John. <laughs> I'm having sound issues because I'm continuing to cough. must just be the sudden dryness of the day. So um, if you need to leave and come back in for any kind of reason, that's completely fine. Jean, are you not able to hear us? You can chat. Okay. Thus, he's letting us know. So yeah, come go and come back in. Uh, anyway, how many of you are in the process of taking TA 103 theater appreciation right now. Okay, so this is something that you'll come up with um, in the future. You'll come up with a musical theater overview and I'm gonna show you that particular um, presentation right now. And then we're gonna go into origins of musical theater for today. And the origins of musical theater will be posted on our Canvas site. And there will be uh, no assignment for, except for reading and I'll post a, just a reading assignment. We will have a quiz on the reading. And that's why I'm trying to um, 
see if you guys can get the materials because I don't want to, it's unfair to assign a quiz before everybody has the book. So that's one of the primary ways that we're going to work through the book is be able to have some quizzes. The quizzes will all be online in your quiz format in Canvas and they will all be open book because I feel like in this day and age, it is really not necessary to memorize anything. Everybody just goes right to the internet to look for everything. So, you know, I, I, it's how do you find things is more important. And then how you express your actual opinion is much more important to me. I don't need you to memorize facts about anything from the book. So it'll be, you know, sort of leading questions and short answer. And then there'll be some multiple choice. Each quiz is 25 points and there'll be four of them and they're roughly three weeks apart or something like that. So it's a way to help you um, understand or digest the information that's in the book that I think is maybe kind of interesting. So let's take a look at this. All right, <clears throat> I'll do a quick screen share and we'll take a look at this just introduction and we'll see. And let me know if you can see everything. I know that apparently there is some difficulty seeing um, video on Canvas, even if it has been embedded. So just let me know if you're not seeing anything. Josephine, question? Uh, yeah, I have a question about the quiz. Yeah. Uh, is it okay to have the book in front of you? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't do the quizzes. They're not going to be proctored. They're not going to be anything. You can literally, uh, they'll be open for two hours, you know, and here, my thought is that if you haven't done the reading, this will make you actually open the book. <laughs> it's very pragmatic. I would much rather have you open the book and try to answer the correct question correctly, instead of like a couple people I knew when I was going to school, it's like, now, nah, you know, I'm just going to fill it in the way the design makes on the paper. I think I'll go one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two. Oh, look, a zigzag. That's how I'm going to fill in my, and that doesn't really do anything. So um, I, since I know, since I personally know people that have filled in a quiz that way, I really don't want you to fill in a quiz that way. I'd rather have you actually look at the information and think, oh, maybe that's kind of interesting, or this is stupid, or you're making me laugh, or and, and I do try to make you laugh. So there will be some things that maybe seem absurd. So just, just know that that's you know, part of my wacky personality. So yeah, you can have the book in front of you. <laughs> All right, let me show you this little PowerPoint presentation. And we'll then go to the origins of musical theater. Oh no, that's not what we wanna see. I don't know why you're doing that. What are you guys looking at? You're looking at this screen that says musical theater, the stage is set and ready. Oh, very good. Okay, I thought you were looking at something different. So this is a, on your Canvas site. We looked at it briefly last time. Okay, so this was, uh, I didn't get to it last week, so I just wanna quickly go through it today. And there is a recorded lecture from before, which uh, maybe I didn't put it on here yet. Okay, bad Pam, I didn't put it on. All right, so this just gives you some ideas of how musical theater and, and where it came from. And the reason why I included these images is because musical theater has been many things. And when we do the next PowerPoint on origins, you'll see why it has so many different uh, iterations or different ways that it can be. This is the most typical thing. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Let's see and make us small, there we go. So this is a proscenium arch. It's a window through which the audience views the stage. Yeah. So here you can see the audience is getting ready to be seated. They're looking at a very open space, which is 
filled with some wooden scaffolding representing the era in which this particular play is taking place. This happens to be Hamilton. So it is in the 1700s. So wood is appropriate and appropriate material. If it was a lot of metal, it wouldn't make sense. So the audience is coming in and getting aware of their environment. Notice that there's not much attempt to include the theater space in this design at all. It, everything is intended for people to sit in the stage and look straight ahead at the theater, okay? So that's called a proscenium theater. Here's another kind of theater. Street musicians performing in New Orleans. Now in New Orleans, they have a huge culture of street music and uh, it's very, very important for funerals. It's important for, of course, Mardi Gras. It's important in many different aspects of life that you include music, you include, and street, I'm not saying that that is a derogatory term at all. It's really an elevated celebratory kind of message that they can't just say it in words. It's not like you know, the president walks from the Capitol to the White House. It's the band takes you. It carries your entire spirit with you. So you want to expand the feeling of what is musical theater. Again, look at this very um, restricted in a way, everyone's in the same costume. It's a very tight choreographed, they're held all in place by a pole equally on each person's shoulder. And then see this little device that's on the bar. This is part of it. And then a close up of the death scene of Tony and Maria in West Side Story. And then very funny, we get these, you know, like bare ankles. <laughs> I always think about weird things like that. So anyway, you know, this is inside of a, of a we're looking at a close up in a traditional uh, theater piece, but this is more like a movie still because we are so close up. This is very much like an open stage. This is not a, a proscenium. This may be a thrust in front of a, just a flat. Um, they're performing in front of a flat wall. This curtain may in fact be revealed later to be a proscenium. So there's a lot of things to look at. Let's just take a look at this little PowerPoint. And I wonder if I can actually, I just, I think I'll just, I'm, I can't, the, I can't remember how to present, that's my problem. So we're just gonna try it this way. And actually, no, I think I'll do it this way. I'll, I'll take it to a different screen. And then I think maybe I have more maneuverability. So you guys always have that option of clicking here and having it go to your desktop so it doesn't go to your page. And in my uh, experience, I'm always doing something on the page and then the pages disappear and need all kinds of crazy things. So let's just see if we can do slideshow format. Okay. Oh, we don't want that side, that's really ugly. There we go. So it is America's most popular theater. Just uh, the origin begins in the US during the colonial 1700s, imitating European touring companies. And we'll spend some time on each one of these sections. So it's, uh, this is just a really a, a very general overview. Yes, and the, um, pardon? I can't see the PowerPoint. Okay, is everyone else, can no one else see the PowerPoint? Uh, I can't see it either. Okay, all right, let's stop that and let me go to this and see if I can get it set up a different way. Thank you very much. It's, you know, it's really interesting when you start presenting in Zoom to try and figure out what actually is happening. Okay. And could you see it at any time? Just in Canvas. Just in Canvas. Okay, so let me go to this uh, now and see if you can see it now. Um, 
it'll it's a different kind of screen share because when it goes from Canvas off site to something else, then you have to select a different screen. So that's a very good uh, piece of information for me. Okay, so now can you see musical theater, America's most popular theater this way? Yes. Yeah. Okay, here we go. And let's, uh, and you can still see it? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Okay, so America's most popular theater and then the origin. Now you can see the origin information. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. We're on the same page. That's always a good. That's always good to know. I mean, uh, at least when we're in person, you, generally you always know that you're looking at the same thing and that students looking at. But here, since everyone looks at their own device, and you know, I'm sending information. Thank you very much for always telling me. Please do not hesitate. You can chat it or you can just shout it out. All right. So it does begin in the U.S. in the 1700s. So think about the U.S. You know, what kind of country is it in the 1700s? How big of a country is it in the 1700s? Uh, remember, you know, we are the upstart. The United States is the upstart. It's a... Um, I don't think we had quite the reputation that Australia had, and this is not a derogatory comment, but Australia's, uh, you know, has fought against the idea of being in a colony of criminals because they would typically put a bunch of criminals on a boat and send them to Australia. Um, and that's something that that country has had to overcome for decades since their origin. But we were considered a colony of the, of, um, Great Britain, and primarily, as we've been told in storybooks, uh, commonly known as history, it was due to um, religious freedom. And yet we managed to somehow replicate restrictions that we, of course, the United States and the people from which they came from European countries uh, imitated those restrictions as well. So they did a very good job imitating European touring companies. And, and imagine that, imagine sending a touring company from Europe or Great Britain to the United States on a boat in these, in these times. So sometimes the imitation was through memory of people who were here and then they remembered seeing something and then they wanted to repeat that or duplicate that experience. So then they would do a more homegrown effort. But these started with ballad operas, a play with dialogue, and songs were inserted with new lyrics to popular tunes. There's very um, little that's sacred about a ballad opera. So when a new popular tune came in, they would just stick a new song into that particular play. And they would have maybe some kind of a theme or a moral or a story behind it. And then, oh, oh yeah, that's not what we want, folks. Okay. Then French co opera comique, spoken dialogue alternating with verse set to popular tunes. So same thing, a different kind of words set to a popular tune. And a popular tune generally in this time would be our classical instruments, but usually piano. By the 1840s, so now we're talking roughly 75 to 100 years later, we have melodrama, burlesque, and musical spectacles. And one of the burlesques that was most common was this Pocahontas, a parody about indigenous people. So you see that we had learned to discriminate from a very early time period. And then minstrel shows, exaggerated fiction of black life, now seen as racist and offensive. Stereotypical characters, very offensive and the worst possible broad strokes to then make a joke at the expense of someone else. And these were some uh, characters that were utilized. And then we had actors in black face trying to also imitate these characters and Al Jolson and Eddie Cantor, Burt Williams. Al Jolson, one of the most 
well known for an actor in blackface. But Burt Williams, you should remember, played the lion in Wizard of Oz. So we do need to recognize that even in musical theater, we have had this very discriminatory and a dark background upon which we've built a form of theater where it was a cultural expression of truth and honesty and actually one that led us through our lives and then became something that was parodied. And that's, that is something that we need to acknowledge. So we actually owe deep gratitude to those people who came before us and to the, the courageous people who just, you know, they lived their life with song and beauty and it was a way to get through the day. And, and this is uh, and not only limited to black people, but people that are desolate and living on isolated in the you know, center of the country in farms by themselves would often console themselves by everyone learning to sing and singing with or without an instrument. So you just need to think about where does it come from, all this thing that turns into frivolity. So here's Burt Williams. You can see him sitting on the desk in the uh, center of your frame. And that is one of the um, famous actors in blackface. And again, this would be, this is a picture from a movie still. The post-American Civil War musical movement is the 1866 is the very first acknowledged starting point for a modern American musical, combination of melodrama and spectacle. Melodrama was stock characters and not only stock characters, but then stock way, stock meaning this is a typical, traditional, expected character and an expected way for that character to act or respond. So it, we had this earlier in the Comédie Française with stock characters. They had a very tight frame against which they needed to write. The, one of the most famous of these, of course, is Molière. And his comedies are considered one of the highest art forms of literature by having a restricted way of writing you can actually very carefully pick your words and there's a, you know, not a lot of inefficiency, everything needs to count. So, but the old, same thing with, um, oh, what am I thinking? A Commedia dell'arte in Italian, um, same thing, stock characters, you know, the old, the old man who lusts after the young girl, the two young lovers, the, um, the, what we've called now the best friend and think about how formulaic we have become when we think about the romantic comedies, even in film and or musicals. So combination of melodrama and spectacle, music, dance, spectacular scenery and costumes and risque chorus girls. And this is a very interesting idea. The risque chorus girls became uh, and lent a a sort of naughty side to theater. And that persisted through the 20th century, even until the last quarter of the 20th century, that maybe theater had this dark side of sex and all kinds of uh, risque things that went on. And certainly uh, when you talk about burlesque, there is a there's sort of a naughty side to it and it's people exposing their skin. And when you see certain photographs, you'll even uh, when you look at in our book, you'll see a great image of costume design renderings for Chicago. And then you see the executed designs, which stripped away most of the designed costume into just bra and undies. So, you know, this idea of risque, chorus girls, cabaret, same thing. It's like what it's, they're selling sex, right? So it's part of what happens. And so what happens in the movies, nothing new. 1879 HMS Pinafore is um, written with Gilbert and Sullivan, which became a, Gilbert and Sullivan became a whole body of work in Great Britain, British operetta, operetta meaning it's completely sung, no spoken words. 
So all of the dialogue is actually lyrics. It is all sung. Everything that you need to know is sung from one character to another and is responded to in the village form by the chorus. An American uh, operetta is Naughty Marietta and then the student prince. The American musical idiom is, we're gonna go into this in more detail in a moment, a review, loosely connected stories with unrelated songs and acts inserted. So just one thing after another. We did this uh, kind of musical review in the fall. Vaudeville, it was a way again, later cleaned up for families. So there would be comedy acts, there would be sort of some, uh, it'd be like a stand-up comedian uh, inserted with songs and other things in between. So there'd be different stand-ups that would come in, but they had, you know, um, trained animal acts. They had families that came in and you'll see the Cohen, the co four Cohens, which then George M. Cohen became a very famous musical star. So there would be a wide variety of, of um, acts that happened in vaudeville. And these would travel from town to town because each individual act was responsible for bringing their own props, their own thing. It was ha happened basically on a bare stage or and some of the acts were even in front of a curtain so they could set up behind. Zigfield Follies, annual review featuring scantily clad chorus girls. Yet again, let's uh, take advantage of women and put them in scantily clad. Star performers were Fanny Bryce, and you know that name from Funny Girl, very well portrayed by Barbara Streisand in the movie, and Will Rogers, W.C. Fields, and you see George M. Cohan, musical comedy with contemporary themes and setting. He was a young boy, started in vaudeville and then came into musical theater. World War I, and again, we're going just for the United States, we had Ragtime, a really known for piano accompaniment, Irving Berlin and Alexander's Ragtime Band is where that started. And now of course, a beautiful musical called Ragtime set in the same time period. And that is Irving Berlin. We have the innovation of early beginnings of jazz. Really jazz is, can be identified more than just dance hall when you start getting things like the clarinet in the background. Also a violin, piano. Mm, I don't know if it's a trumpet or flugelhorn. Does anybody have that musical knowledge? Looks more like a flugelhorn because it has the extra pipe and I'll have to find out and the bell, the shape of the bell. Okay, and a drummer. So playing in a club, early 20th century, we get Broadway, which becomes then a mix of operettas, musical reviews and ragtime. Again, remember when we're saying ragtime, we're not referring to the musical, referring to the um, piano accompaniment, which is very fast. I should try and get a snip for you guys to listen to. And then we have very famous black book musicals by Noble Sisel and U.B. Blake. Shuffle Along in 1921 popularized a form of jazz. It's the first black musical on Broadway. I'm Just Wild About Harry, which then had, was a, actually one of those incredible songs that then Harry Truman took on for his campaign song in 1948. So it lasted 20 years as a popular song. And then Sisel, uh, Cicely and Blake become popular again in the 1970s with Bubbling Brown Sugar and Yubi, which is actually a musical about Yubi Blake. So I'm just wild about Harry. You can see this is an early piece from with a guy wearing a tailcoat with striped pants. This is really around uh, 1910. You can even see the spats on the shoes. And then this, I'm going to see if we can play this clip. Oh, let's see. Hold on. Nah. I don't know what you're seeing, but I went to some weird place. Okay, I guess not. Okay, and um, 
Gregory Hines, one of the famous uh, tap dancing brothers and a tap dancing trio, Hines, Hein, and Dad. The two brothers were Hines and Hines, and their dad was very famous. And then early 20th century, we get Jerome Kern. Wow, somehow I think that these are out of order. Um, Showboat, address serious themes. This is considered the very first bona fide musical for which we have documentation. And we'll talk about that in a minute because the documents were very lost. It addressed serious themes of addiction and racism, has some famous songs, Old Man River, Can't Help Loving That Man. These are ones that you may have heard of that are continued in popularity. George and Ira Gershwin, musicals influenced by jazz and Porgy and Bess, which is of course still still popular. Showboat was reimagined, uh, I think in the 80s or 90s and became a huge success. Porgy and Bess was just again uh, remounted. So still, still very popular. Here's a picture from the original Porgy and Bess by George Gershwin and Du Bois Hayward. Uh, this is Audra McDonald doing Porgy and Bess. And Audra McDonald is from Fresno. She grew up there. She starred in Roger Rocka's Music Hall in Fresno and then became a multi Tony winner and, of course, now an actress. But um, she did Porgy and Bess in one of the remounts and very, very famous. Post World War II, we get Oklahoma, which is the first collaboration of Rogers and Hammerstein. Many firsts for Broadway here. The first Dream Ballet, which is really kind of brutal when you look at it. No Overture, which we so appreciated from West Side Story last time. No Opening Chorus Member. New Standards for Integration of All Production Elements. And when we talk about production elements, what are we talking about? We're talking about the style of acting, how the actors move on stage, what is the stage, what is the scenic design for the stage, how the director has worked with the scenic designer to provide the correct, the correct environment for the play to unfold, how the costumes work in concert with the actor's body, and then work to create a composition for the stage, and then work with the scenic design so that the, the audience is getting a complete stage picture that has unity of theme and color and movement. And again, this would have been performed in a proscenium. So they're really looking at a window frame and a stage picture. It was the longest running musical, Broadway musical when it closed and then has been restaged millions of places. So mid-century American musicals, Roger and Hemistine continue to be popular. This is 1950s to 60s operetta and musical comedy. Again, remembering operetta is no spoken word, only sung. The new creative teams of Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe, uh, Condon and Green with Leonard Bernstein, and they would be writing the book, and then Leonard Bernstein, the music and orchestration. Remember, listen to his orchestration in West Side Story last time. And then the new stars of Mary Martin, who was South Pacific Peter Pan and Sound of Music. And then she, of course, played Peter Pan in the movie. But, you know, then uh, Julie Andrews played Sound of Music played Maria in Sound of Music in the movie. So Alan Alda, who's very famous from MASH, starred in Guys and Dolls. Julie Andrews was a star of the stage in My Fair Lady, but of course in the movie it was, um, oh my goodness, Breakfast at Tiffany's. My name is Audrey Hepburn. So, you know, Joel Gray was the new MC in Cabaret. So again, we have stars that start in theater, then go into theater, they go into movies, stars that were, they shift back and forth and we're starting to get a more blurring of the edges. West Side Story, the modern adaptation of Jerome and Juliet, the operetta score, Shakespeare's story, innovative choreography. We looked at some of this last time, groundbreaking musical. And then book, book musicals, one of the most popular forms. And this is a dance sequence. Oh, sorry. 
and not from West Side Story, just a dance sequence. I love looking at crazy stuff. So we go into the 1960s alternative musicals and that would be a picture from what we just saw. The anti-war sentiment of Vietnam is growth of for off and off off Broadway. And those become very, very popular and more popular spaces as a reaction against the elaborate spectacle, the large orchestra and the chorus. Hair is a huge uh, popular pop rock musical explored the worlds of hippies and protesters. The characters are young, ill and homeless. <clears throat> and yet when you look at those, when you look at uh, production stills from the musical that was on stage, you can see how naive um, the designers were at looking at homelessness and how cleaned up they made it look. Although when it was presented, it was shocking. So people had not actually given visibility to the homeless prior to that. So you need to always understand the context through which we see things now and how much greater our experience has become. And part of the, partly because we do have things like the internet, which are really um, ways to pave <coughs> and equalize imagery. So hair paved the way for concept musicals such as Rent, in Chicago. So we'll see those two. Um, three of you picked Rent and Colby's picking Chicago. So here's a the album cover for Hair, this sort of blurred image of the wild and luxurious and celebrated hair, people wearing their hair uncoiffed without um, you know, rigidity, both women and men had major hairstyling things to make sure that their hair stayed absolutely plastered to their head or ratted and bouffant even up through the 60s. So this was a big relaxation and the hair emblemized this and it was a huge point of discussion in the culture. Concept musicals are really Stephen Sondheim's big claim to fame Company, which is a series of vignettes, short scenes connected by theme. Follies, a psychological examination of lives. Past and present, group of Follies performers gathered for a reunion, so they're reminiscing, looking back. And then Michael Bennett's A Chorus Line. He conceived, choreographed, and directed this. It was really land break, landmark musical because it showed the audition process for a Broadway show <clears throat> followed these 17 dancers through what all of the different kinds of things that they had to do, what made them successful, how they were often um, broken down and disregarded and had a lot of really tough experiences. All of these captured in a musical and would became a huge success, the success of every man. And that then truly without, sorry, I keep touching my, um, whatever that thing is called on your, your laptop. Anyway, um, that actually without Chorus Line, we would never have been able to have Rent because Rent then could go even one step further from Chorus Line and become this rock opera that really dealt with the deep um, themes of addiction, HIV, love, uh, otherness, gender fluidity, all kinds of things, and a wide variety of musical influences. And then we finally get to Rock of Ages, which actually started in the Sunset Bar in Hollywood, went to Vegas, a very non-traditional way of getting to Broadway, and then from Broadway to the movies. <laughs> So of course, starring uh, um, Tom Cruise, that was a very unlikely choice, I thought. The British mega musicals, are, they used many American imports and then in the 80s, the mega musicals become standard. These are huge blown out, um, lavish, lots of money spent. Miss Saigon based on Puccini's Madame Butterfly, one of the first takes place in the last year of the Vietnam War. It's a fusion of drama and music. And then Cats was extraordinarily popular and just mind blowing for the fact that they 
used such technology. They put a junkyard on stage so that the scale of the human beings playing the cats was in scale with the size of the trunk that opened in the junkyard. It was just overwhelming in terms of the size and the amount of stuff that was on stage. I actually saw that on Broadway. It's phenomenal. It was in the 80s. Les Mis, of course, Phantom of the Opera, which played and played and played and played and continues to play. And Broadway audiences, it's very expensive. People can be rabid fans in much the same way as they are of opera. Some save for years. The audiences tend to be older. And this in Times Square, a ticket booth called Tickets Tickets is half price tickets for the same day Broadway shows. So you can line up there at 10 a.m. and you can get a ticket for a matinee and you can get a ticket for an evening show at half price. And sometimes you can get really great seats doing that. So. We all hope for the day when Broadway comes back and that'll be a lot of fun for us. So that's a kind of a lot of info. Any sort of digested comments on what we just saw? Does anything new come to mind? Anything surprising? You guys are already, man, that was a snooze. I already had all that information at my fingertips. No? No, uh, no thoughts about that. No thoughts about um, mega musicals. Uh, you know, we've, of course, the U.S. had a couple of huge mega musicals. The one, what's the biggest musical you ever, if you are in that world and you love musicals, that you can think of? And we'll look at some of this piece. Um, Wicked, maybe. Um, but I would also comment that like it's funny to see how like in the beginning it was kind of very um, I don't know the word derogatory like women were being like sold for like sex okay. and, like the minstrel shows and everything and then as it like progressed it kind of like was like taken back by like the people that were like once um, yeah. not saying that is all gone but you know what I mean. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It is, it is important to recognize where we come from. And it, it's much better to look it straight in the face than it is to try to ignore it. And, you know, uh, many things have been built on things that are untowards and things that we wish we didn't have to acknowledge, but we do need to. Just like human beings, you know, we're, human beings are infallible. You can't look at a human being from the past and idolize without also looking at their faults because that's who creates the entire human being. So we wanna do take a special, special acknowledgement of all that kind of stuff. So thanks for bringing that up. Any other giant musicals you can think of? Cause I'll tell you the one I'm thinking. I was gonna say, I mean, I don't know numbers and figures, but I'm sure Hamilton has blown out everyone at this mm -hmm. point. But I would say before that, like, is the Music Man a musical or Oklahoma? Yeah. Things oh, yeah, like on the roof, like things like those, I think had a really long longevity. Yeah. Um, more so than maybe some of the current ones. Yeah. But the, I'm sure the current ones all made more money just because that's what they do. Because they charged more money? I don't know. Yeah. They had better touring shows, that too. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, anybody else, um, uh, something that just comes to mind. It helps me know where your background is. The Lion King. The Lion King. Who was that? It was me, Colby. Colby. Okay, so Lion King is what I think of as really the American mega musical. It was unlike anything that had come before. And it was unlike cats. I mean, it, it just basically the human beings created all of the scenery. It just was a one big rock. I mean, phenomenal. We'll be looking at the making of Lion King. And the reason why I bring that up in terms of mega musical is look, just guess, and if you know, please don't guess, but just if you don't know, guess the cost for the costumes for Lion King, the stage play. The first production. 
Now remember Lion King is based on what? Hamlet, right? Or one of Shakespeare's. Well, okay, but more immediately than one of Shakespeare's, what is the musical, the stage musical based on? The movie. The There's movie, the which is? The Lion King. And what form is that? Animation. Yeah, it's a cartoon, right? We're looking at a cartoon and it becomes this mega musical. So that's kind of fascinating. So just take a guess, just, just you guys throw up numbers in the chat about how much you think the costumes cost for, for the uh, Lion King. Just an interesting thing. Throw them up, I'm not seeing any. Get your fingers moving. Okay, okay, okay. Keep going, keep going. There's plenty of room for everyone to weigh in. All right, I'm gonna start reading them off, but keep going. So we have 2 million, 500,000, 4 million, 1.4, 5 million, 10 million, 3.7, 3 million. Okay. 700,000. 7 million. Anybody else? All right. 10 million. $10 million. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they, they're bankrolled by a very big company, right? Disney. So Disney has the deep pockets. They took a huge leap of faith on Julie Tamor, who had done uh, a, one thing before that, I think called, uh, hmm, maybe called Painted Bird. And she was really a costume designer puppeteer and she made gigantic puppets, right? And that was instrumental in research and development for the incredible creatures and what you saw in Lion King. And when we see Lion King, you'll see why that $10 million was really worth it and things worked. And then we can talk about why things like Spider-Man did not work. So, Directed, directed and conceived by the same director, right? Julie Taymor, who has quite a reputation of, you know, wanting her own way and wanting it a very specific way, which is what we call an auteur director. They have, like Michael Bennett, they have the, the she didn't do the choreography, but she was instrumental in the movement and in the costume, in the scenic design, the whole overall picture as the director. So you have complete um, end to that. So we'll take a look at some of the Lion King pieces and I'll post them on because there's a lot of information on the making of Lion King and then how it performs in, in the theater and how all encompassing it is to actually feel that particular piece. Has anyone seen the Lion King live? Just uh, hands in, in the uh, participants is good. And Car, did you see it in Vegas? Uh, no, actually I saw it in LA at the Pantages. Mm -hmm. And Colby, did you, where'd you see it? I saw it at the Pantages too. Okay. All right, so because sometimes where you see it depends on what thing you've seen. So none of the rest of you have seen Lion King, right? Well, we'll take a look at it. It's worth seeing and it's worth looking at uh, part of the animation. And, you know, isn't that funny? We use the term animation because it just sounds better than cartoon. So <laughs> everything becomes a question of semantics. It's one of those crazy things. Um, but it's an amazing piece and an amazingly beautiful um, experience as you are looking at um, musicals in general. So let's go on to really talk um, about the origin. Yeah. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so was merchandise like always a thing? Like, cause nowadays, like you see people like wearing merchandise for like their favorite musicals. Like when did that become a thing? Anybody have an idea for that merchandising? It's an interesting topic. 
Uh, did any of you see Back to the Future, the original? Okay. Is there a time when merchandising becomes um, evident in that movie that you can think of? Anybody have an idea? Isn't it like Pepsi or? It's an article of clothing. Uh... So, you know, remember Back to the Future, a guy from somewhat present day goes back to the 50s and he's um, carried to a home and then somehow uh, Leah Thompson, it's Leah Thompson and um, Michael J. Fox. And she sees him in his underwear and it has Calvin Klein on it because Calvin Klein is written in the waistband of his underwear, right? Calvin Klein was really the first big merchandising marketer to put in fashion, put his name on everything. And when, I'm trying to think when that happened because yeah, I became super uh, aware of it when I was working in LA and commercials because you can't publicize, you can't actually publicize two products at once. So I would do a whole series of Dockers commercials, a whole series of Nike commercials. And when you're doing Nike, then you can't, you have to make sure that they have no logos on their shirts. Nowadays, when you ask somebody to bring a shirt with no logo, it's like, it's hard to find them because it has become so popular. So, you know, that's something I'll have to research is when did merchandising happen? Um, I don't remember anything other than programs until really more of the modern era, which I would put at 1980. So let's, that's a really good topic to research. And I don't know the answer. And now of course, merchandising, they count on merchandising for a significant amount of income. So it's a very, it's a very interesting thing. And that people have decided to adopt a particular uh, item or name or word as something that they would like to wear. And yet when I go up to somebody and I say, oh yeah, you love the Chiefs because they're wearing a Kansas City Chiefs t-shirt, they'll say, what? What are you talking about? Like they put it on brain dead and they're just putting this thing on and not aware of what they're wearing. So it's, it is really an interesting discussion. And for me, as a costume designer, psychologically understanding the reason behind clothing and then to have somebody so mindlessly put something on that they don't realize that they're blaring off, you know, Harley Davidson or something. So good question. Let's keep, let's keep that in the, our mind. Anything else come to mind? So it's interesting, this idea, I, maybe I should, let me pause. I didn't really give you enough time to respond. <laughs> My kids will say that, mom, takes nine seconds for it to go from your mouth into my brain. So zip it up. Um, so just think about it for a second. Just take a couple minutes and we'll uh, think about, you know, does anything else come to mind when we're thinking about musicals? And then we'll work on what it might be. Well, I have a comment about the Lion King and maybe like why it was so successful. Yeah. I think it like kids liked it and I don't ever remember like musicals being for kids. It was kind of when I, I just associated it with like, you know, classical music and almost like older people that are super sophisticated. And this was almost like for every American kind of, and it was nostalgic too, because of the movie and it, it's, it, I don't really remember people bringing kids to musicals so much until The Lion King. It was it was like super accessible. So just a, it was a multi generational hit. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like like I don't ever yeah like kids little kids didn't I didn't really associate them with musicals and this is kind of the first one where the whole family like would go. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a comment on that? I can think of, um, I think you are very possibly right. I don't think it's particularly American, but I think going back to the comment that somebody made about um, 
about the uh, origin of the story, right? So what could be the origin of that story? Remember we talked about, as somebody said, Hamlet, remember? So Hamlet, if you recall, is the uh, king is usurped, the king is dead. So we come up with Mufasa is dead. Same in, is the king, the ghost of, of, of Hamlet's father comes. We do see Mufasa gets us, comes in voiceover. His bad brother, Scar, wants to overtake it, but Hamlet, um, but, you know, Simba is the prince, king, and runs away from being king. Now, of course, not everybody dies, but um, he is responsible for his own father's death. We do see that wonderful, harmonious time in the beginning. So it is a very deep story and one that is a story of loss, loss of parent that is very deep and everyone can identify with it. Everyone had a parent, everyone was born from somewhere, regardless of what your, what your family looks like, you know, you have some sort of a understanding that you come from somewhere else. And so I think it did resonate deeply with both adults and children, very definitely multi-generational. Um, because the movie was so beloved, I think maybe a lot of people wanted to see what it looked like on stage. Interestingly, the first time I saw it was on stage. I didn't ever see the cartoon movie. And then the first time I actually saw the movie, the animation, I saw it in Polish. So, you know, it was even in another language and it didn't have, it had that I would, did not detract from the power of the story. So it was a very powerful story. Before that, we had Beauty and the Beast, which was also a, an absolute mega hit in terms of animation. And it was one of those landmark things when it was Disney had really gotten back on its feet. So yeah, you might be right, Colby. Any other comments on that? Okay, let's look at the really the origins. I alluded to this briefly when I talked about it. And I hope I can get this because I am such a bad uh, presenter at this stuff. So let me see if I can uh, get this to work. Part of it is I have to figure out how to, there we go, I think I can do it this way. Okay, so I'm gonna screen share and we're gonna look at origins of musical theater in more um, grit. We're just gonna stick with that concept of musical theater. And so other than that, there, uh, other than the assignment that we have, there won't be any other assignment. So you don't need to worry about that. And then we'll do deal with the textbook stuff. So origins of musical theater is everyone seeing the screen that says origins of musical theater. Yes. Thank you. I'm just like, yay, something worked. Okay. We talked a little bit about where they come from, but here's one of the things that is not really talked about much. The knowledge we have about it is unstable, meaning there is no reliable source of information about musicals. They're thought of lesser than other art forms. It's an event without cultural authority. They are a live entertainment not a work, not an opus, not something grand, not based on a novel, not based on myth or tradition. So, you know, remember when I said it was risky uh, chorus girls, risque clad chorus girls, you know, it's like the information that we have about them in the early days is very sketchy and not a lot of it exists. So musicals, one of the reasons why it's hard to track it down is they're multidisciplinary. The documental evidence compiled from manuscript, which is when they wrote things by hand, then later typed on a machine, and that would be a manual typewriter. That could be notes. It would be the script or a prompt book that the prompter who would be standing in the pit and then prompt dialogue from there to the stage if it was needed. Orchestrations, um, sheet music from popular songs, 
sketches which were hand drawn, not duplicated. Remember, there's no way to Xerox or duplicate information. Like, you know, we think nothing of going to Hinko's, put down your buck and you can get almost anything copied. Nothing like that. Set design and costume design, when we're trying to research this, this um, phenomena of musical comes from a wide variety of sources. Some of it's in individual hands, very little museum documentation because it was considered not very important. So there's few 19th century photographs and those would be in the very beginning of the musicals that we talked about. Remember we talked about the early part in the colonial, which would be 1770s and then going into the 19th century of the 1800s. There were some posed black and whites. So photography started in about 1848 and it was a very long process. You had to actually pose, stay completely still and then they could take the camera, the flash went off. You guys all remember seeing that puff of smoke and they were in black and white. <clears throat> Color photography really doesn't come into its own until after the 1940s, but the common person really did not have access to, the, to um, color photography until mm, late 60s. Even in the early 60s, black and white was still far more common. So we have to remember where we are right now with our advanced technology and our ways of looking at things and our access to information off the internet where we can literally look up, oh, I wanna see a still from Hamilton. Oh, I wanna see, oh, I wonder what does, you know, we can look probably look up Jean's address in France and see the outside of where he lives, right? Well, that kind of stuff did not exist. And so when you're trying to then recreate or understand where the origin of musicals come from, we're really looking at a bunch of pieces of paper or a bunch of hand-drawn sketches and trying to figure out what the heck do they do? Because when did recording come into common? Remember recording was in the very early 1900s and then they would record on wax. So, you know, we don't even have many recordings of these because first of all, it was motivated by money. And yeah, no surprise, right? It's not a high art form. It's how can we make money? If you saw the showman there, you could see parts of this motivation by money. It's actually an interesting movie just to see just for that portion of, oh, I can make some money off this. Let's get some people together and we're gonna, we're gonna you know, put them on the road. And sometimes that became for in the common vernacular of that time, a freak show. Let's take these very unusual looking people and exploit them and exploit whatever talent they have and then have people pay money to see them. So again, we need to really look at our background and just recognize it, look it in the face. So materials circulated to reproduce a production. So, you know, there'd be maybe some kind of sketch that would come. This is the costume they're gonna wear. This is the set. This is how it's gonna look. This is the, this is the loose sketch of, this, of the script. And once it went around from place to place to place and generally in the US at this time traveling by train and before that just traveling by covered wagon. And you think about um, the, uh, the early thing in Wizard of Oz where the man comes selling door to door trinkets, you know, things like that. There was little intrinsic value. In other words, the values, the materials needed to create a show were not valued because once they were exhausted their opportunity to make money, they were just disposed of. So we don't have much information on these early musicals and it's taken quite a lot. And the reason why I, I selected this textbook is because he's really tried to look at how we can look at early things in their most accurate form. So the show altered and changed, just like we looked in the previous lecture of, you know, they would stick in new lyrics. Oh, there's a new popular song. Let's stick that in. And so the show may have started out as one thing. And then by the time it tours the US, it's completely different based on whatever popular songs at the moment. Because again, it's a way to spread information from place to place to place. There's a movie that's just come out called, uh, 
something like reading the news in the West. It's Tom Hanks, it's a brand new movie about a guy that goes on horseback from town to town reading the news because they didn't have newspapers. They didn't have a printing press. They had just counted on the oral tradition and musicals had an oral tradition. So they would bring this particular entertainment to another town. And then they would insert things like a local town name or maybe the song that would be popular in that town would be inserted. So there's no one definite, and boy, I need some spelling help there, production or record. So there's not one. How is the musical defined? It's a type of performance. And there are so many different kinds of performance. What we need to do is collectively look at it by the creative processes that are in common through musicals. So a musical has talking, it has singing, it can be accompanied by instruments, whether they're seen and unseen. So in the, in the beginning of time, we wanted the instruments to be down in the orchestra pit. And in Broadway musicals now, the orchestra may be playing four stories down in the basement and the performers are looking at a video uh, or a screen that is live showing the conductor conducting the musicians in the basement. So it's a really interesting way to go from seen and unseen. There's dancing. So mixed dancing, meaning both men and women together, mixed styles of dancing. So it can be a waltz and then it can be at the twist, whatever needs to, to be there, but also other kinds of movement because remember we get modern dance starting in the early 1900s as well. So the Czech theorist, Ivo Oselsob says theater, which speaks, sings and dances. So that's your touch phrase for the musical defined. So what's it called? Well, early it was called a musical comedy. And again, that's again, a lesser light thing to think about. It's just a comedy, it's light. We don't have to really pay attention to it. It's called an operetta, it's called a musical play. It's called a folk opera, it's called a review. It's called burlesque. You know, all these different words were kind of collectively held together by this process of talking, singing, dancing. So in the end, it becomes defined by content. So those, those kinds of performances or events that are somewhat without a story. So a musical review would be a, a collection of songs one after the other by a solo performer, by a duo performer, by a quartet or a family. But basically one thing happen happening after another in a musical format without linking of a theme or story. A minstrel show, which is taking the rich cultural heritage of the black life in America and then putting that on stage, showing that life. And then this is also shown sometimes in blackface. So again, it becomes a, a point of cringing for us right now. Not that the stories are not valid. So the, the snapshot of the culture would be extremely valid. Burlesque, and again, this is capitalizing on the risque nature of theater and that you would go there to see something that you would not see in your everyday life or something that might be illegal or showing, even showing you um, the body parts would be considered very inappropriate, but things can happen on stage and comments can be made that would, could never be made in common society because they would be uh, scorned. They would be looked down upon they would be considered to be less than. Um, when, if you went to a burlesque show and any person starring in a burlesque show may be considered to be a prostitute, particularly in terms of women. Variety show. And this would be one that we talked about earlier where it could be a mixture between comedian and song and different things come together. And vaudeville, which would be a sort of a more risque or a cruder form of a variety show. 
And these could all be packed up each individual act and then travel together in the same way that we think about carnivals traveling together, each in their own wagon, each in their own train car, each with their own um, set pieces or props, and then traveling to a blank stage, which might just be a wooden raised platform outside or possibly a wooden raised platform inside. And then second definition would be those with stories. So this is storytelling musical. There is actually tension between the narrative parts, which is usually spoken, here's what's happening. And then when we get to the performative parts, they're sung or danced. These are when we show the emotion of what's happening. In addition to these things, we have plays with added songs, and that's becoming more and more popular. Musical comedies, anyway, those just with light uh, storylines, musical plays, and again, so uh, what's the difference between plays with added songs and musical plays, mostly spoken? Operettas only sung opera and opera versus the classical form of opera becomes a Broadway commodity, a rock opera or a folk opera. So it really, there's a beginning and a middle and an end to the story, which then is expressed through both speaking, singing and dancing. And finally, it is a live medium. Musical theater, no longer called just comedy, but just a larger, a larger umbrella under which to hold all of musical entertainment and theater. No perf two performances are identical, even if it, everything else remains identical. If you remove as many variables as you can, you see it at exactly the same, the same theater with exactly the same cast, with exactly the same costumes and set and you see it on a Friday night and you see it the following Friday night, no two performances would be identical. And one of the reasons is because we have that unpaid actor, which is called the audience. And the audience is then part of the experience of the performance. It's not a film musical or a television musical, which tends to be technology-based. So regardless of how the musical comes to be, you are seeing it through a technology-based environment. So it is very controlled. You only see what the camera is allowing you to see. The camera is defining the frame of the picture <clears throat> versus when you are looking and you go to a musical performance, you as an audience member can choose what you look at. Yes, you are somewhat directed there as we talked last time. You are directed there by lighting, you're directed by costume and color, you're directed by movement, but you have a choice. The entire scene is open to you versus in a film or television where the camera is dictating what you see and what you don't see. So it's a very interesting way to look at the differences between a live medium of musical theater and the filmed technological version. What is Broadway? Broadway is a geographic area, a street. It's the epicenter of New York City. It has become, it's, all, it's been there for a long time, but has become and stands for and identifies a completely commercial, collaborative, and vernacular character of musical theater in New York. And then when we say a Broadway play, we say a Broadway play comes to Santa Barbara when it goes to the Granada Theater. It comes to Los Angeles at the, at the Pantages. So whether it is coming from uh, any place that it, uh, from which a Broadway musical comes, it always hands, is handled the word Broadway generally in the title. Chicago as seen on Broadway, Rent, the Broadway version. And when it goes to other countries, it is considered a Broadway musical. It's no longer unchallenged uh, as the form becomes more popular. So popularity is then changing the way that we view musicals. 
there is a cultural shift away from musical comedy. The levity is still prized, but the darker subject matter has become more prevalent or is equally as acceptable. You can talk about, you know, love among the ruins and you can talk about addiction among the ruins. Each, any subject matter is open. The sophistication of expression so that you're seeing a much more complex character, the complexity of life. We are looking at everyday life. It's a lens through which we can see our life unfolding by real people telling the story in real time. And then the aesthetic ambition when we look at how technology, meaning the ways that we can build things and operate things has influenced the way that we see things on stage. So there's a wide variety of um, overlap there. But at the same time, no matter how ambitious the aesthetic becomes, it is still not intended to be viewed through a piece of technology. And that's one of the difficulties that we're having now with the pandemic is we can't see things live. So we're th seeing things through a camera that we were intended and in all intent to be seen live. So mu musicals matter. The popularity demonstrates how they resonate with the public. You know, people want to go see them. They want to be entertained. There's something really uplifting. It touches more of our senses to both hear and see things than it does with song it, than just words. It is something in this age, vital in this age of multimedia. It, it sort of, we are used to things happening fast. We're used to really rapid imagery coming in front of our eyes. And musicals actually can fill that part of us. And it provides one way to take the pulse of the American culture, just one way. All right, any last words before we call it a day? I just had a quick question. Sure. Uh, I didn't quite understand uh, what the difference was between uh, musical theater and Broadway. Between musical theater and Broadway. So yeah. Broadway becomes the term through which success is measured. When a musical theater piece has made it to Broadway and has successful performances, it is really considered to be elevated to a larger popularity. So then when it can use that term Broadway, thereafter, when that, when that piece is then remounted in any way. So it's just a measure of success. It's like saying an Academy Award in a way. Oh, okay, thank you. Any, any other just like parting thoughts? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that because you, you were talking about the shift that sort of occurred in the musical yeah. genre, I guess you could say, or, or whatnot. Um, I sort of, for my friends, for myself, I like the fact that there's been a shift from just being a source of levity to darker themes, because I do th think that even though, lev you know, levity is always appreciated and, and, and it's, you know, happiness and, and laughter are good things. I think that you can also find joy within dark themes and how they're being um, explored and, and things like that. So I, I sort of welcome that change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, very good point. I mean, we think about that in terms of popular music. You know, being willing from going from the 50s of rock and roll and purity and love and all that to going to rap, to other kinds of music, they're really willing to take on very hard topics and express them exactly how we feel. So and that's, a, that's a really good point. We need to be willing to mine those feelings that we have. It becomes great, a greater expression for the, all people. Any last thoughts? Okay, if you haven't done your assignment, please do that. The musical to, uh, from stage musical to movie musical. And then we'll be thinking about that, looking at the movie musical for your first play critique. I will be following up with the bookstore and both the library to see about digital copies because there will be a reading assignment upon which we'll have a quiz next week. So I will want to make sure that everyone has equal opportunity for that information. Okay, any last questions? 
and be sure you email me if you ever want to see me for office hours. I've, I've posted some times, but I'm not, I won't just open up a Zoom and hang out there for two hours if I don't have anybody coming to see me, but I'm always happy to meet with you. So other than that, I'll see you on Thursday. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, have a great day. It's so beautiful here. How Thank about you where you are, Casper? <laughs>